In cooperation with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Duitsland Institute and the Atlantische Commissie, a round table was organized, divided in three sessions. The first round, three speakers discussed the subject in what direction are American and European politics maneuvering themselves. We have a mismatch between requirements and resources, uh, as the military likes to say, between ends and means, or goals and means. Um, and so then the, the next one question I wanted to address for you is, how do you deal with that mismatch? And what are the alternatives as we go forward? Well, let me lay out three different paths for you. And this begins to answer, I think, the questions that you've put. Three different paths. I don't know which one we're going to go on, because different people in our body politic want to take us in different directions. So the first of these three strategies tries to deal with this mismatch by spending more on defense. Increase the defense budget, say, to 650. You add another $100 billion, let's say, to the defense budget. I would call this strategy assertiveness. It kind of goes back to the previous decade, the decade of George W. Bush. Right? This is a strategy of American assertiveness, a focus on American leadership, American exceptionalism. It is more of a values-based strategy rather than an interest-based strategy. So try to promote your own values uh, when you deal with adversaries. You're not going to be particularly accommodating because by and large they don't hold your values. Uh, and so you are constantly challenging your adversaries. You don't always look for compromise. And as a result of that, you start having problems with some of your allies, which we saw in the last uh, decade. Um, for us or against us. Uh, so this is a strategy that is, uh, is a more muscular America that focuses on leadership, focuses on, um, on these values. And you see this, you know, if I had to put some names behind the strategy, it's John McCain, it's Lindsey Graham, who I think we're running for president, uh, uh, Jeb Bush, if you read some of his recent speeches and you look at some of his advisors, I think he's moving in this direction. Uh, so that's one strategy. Uh, it's expensive, uh, but it does uh, promote American, American values. But it takes a very narrow look at American interests, it's to take a broader look, but it would rely very heavily, as I said, on our friends and allies. Um, so that brings me to uh, the last question, which is, to what degree, and, and my own preferred option is the third, it's sort of the Goldilocks option, but the question is, will it work? And it depends heavily on our allies to uh, step up and contribute more. And so let me just dispense quickly with Asia and the Middle East and then spend a little bit more time with Europe since we're here. Uh, in Asia, uh, we can look to the Japanese to spend more on defense. They are at 1%. They have just gone a tiny bit above their 1% limit. Uh, but uh, Prime Minister Abe is actually being fairly aggressive in terms of Japanese security policy, trying to open up his aperture, trying to use this legislation before the Diet now, uh, to uh, uh, focus more on regional defense rather than just defense of Japanese allies. Uh, South Korea is a strong partner. They spend much more on defense. In the Middle East, um, we can call on friends occasionally to do things. We look at look, the operations against ISIS now, a coalition of 60 nations, many Arab nations there. But then you immediately run into the risk of sectarian conflict. We've seen this uh, in the case of uh, ISIS, where we have uh, Shia militias backed by Iran fighting the Sunnis, and it, you have sectarian overtones. You see this with Saudi Arabia today in Yemen. Again, the risk of of a sectarian conflict developing from looking to our Middle Eastern allies to do more. So we got problems in the Middle East too. So the conclusion there is the spotlight really is on Europe. So let's look at Europe. And what do we see? First of all, we see a NATO uh, that actually, if you look at the Wales summit, did very well. <clears throat> Wales, the Wales summit was a turning point, I think, in terms of the alliance. 
All the right things were said. Now they got to deliver. But if you go down to NATO headquarters uh, and you start talking to various nations about these issues, there is a divide, clearly a divide. You've got the Baltic states, you've got Poland, you've got some of the Nordic states, all <coughs> focusing on Russia, all focusing on Article 5 and how do you deter. And you've got the southern states saying, wait a minute, we've got all of these immigrants coming in, we've got proliferation problems coming in from the south, we've got Syria uh, and ISIL to worry about. Uh, and so you have a real divide within the alliance on this is what the conference is about, you know, these two different threats. And you see the alliance divided. Not deeply divided, but at least in their orientation. And what they're trying to do at NATO headquarters uh, is to try to create approaches that maintain that degree of unity in the alliance. Then finally, uh, you look at our best allies and capabilities. The UK, Britain, many ways are cousins in the United States. Uh, they were with us in Iraq, they were with us in Afghanistan, uh, and they spent their military fortune on operations. Their equipment is worn out, uh, they need to rebuild uh, their uh, capital inventory in their military, uh, their budget is tight because of their economic problems, and in addition to that, they maintain a nuclear deterrent, they have to spend money on Trident, and they're trying to rebuild two aircraft carriers. So a lot of their investment is going into Trident boats and aircraft carriers, and that doesn't leave much to recapitalize uh, their conventional forces. Where is the United States going to go uh, to find willing and capable allies if, in fact, uh, we try to solve this resource requirement mismatch with the notion that our allies should pitch in and do more? Okay. Please welcome Wilfried von Bredo. Well, let me start like this. Today, the transatlantic relations look much brighter than 10 years ago. But the gap between the world policy perceptions of Washington and of the European capitals, or let's say most of them, uh, is still wide. There are still enough bridges to span this uh, gap, but if you allow me an architectural um, comparison, the German Autobahn bridges, when they were built, were built in the belief that they would last forever. But today we recognize tiny and sometimes not so tiny cracks in their foundations. And this is also true for the security institutions on both sides of the Atlantic. We do know that it is necessary to repair and renovate these bridges. This is, however, rather expensive, and it must be done without interrupting the traffic. Very difficult, and not without temporary delays and traffic jams. Although, the overall tone of transatlantic relations during the Obama administration has been largely positive. We continue to observe a whole range of different political perceptions, misunderstandings, and sources of mistrust even between Washington and, and Europe. All these issues would need a long and thorough examination in order to find out where the US-European differences can be overcome and where they will probably prevail. And it is true, as we just heard, that there is not one opinion in Washington and one opinion in, in European capitals, but both sides have very different perceptions and solutions, so it's even more complicated. The success in striking a deal with Iran and blocking the country's access to nuclear weapons if it turns out to be a success, is an encouraging example of American-European diplomatic cooperation. But it is too early to be sure of the congressional approval of its ratification. Unfortunately, the ongoing process of constructing the European Union has lost much of its public support. The number of so-called Eurosceptics is on the rise at the margins of our societies, but meanwhile 
also in the center. Furthermore, the political cultures in Europe did not converge over the last decades, which means that the national governments are often guided by different perceptions and are looking in different directions when they define their priorities. The main obstacle is the deep-seated rejection of such a tougher policy by the German public. Second, another one of the Euroscepticism, um, another one is the Euroscepticism which spreads among the German electorate. A third one is the not yet really destructive but slowly, slowly rising anti-Americanism in some circles of German society. And the fourth one is the somewhat irritating experience of the German government and the public that German leadership role in Europe often arises instantly the uneasiness of other governments and reanimates immediately the image of the bullying imperialist Germans of the first half of the 20th century. Uh, the Greek public, for instance, seems to hate Germany as much as the Venezuelans hate the United States of America. On the contrary, in Germany, for instance, a strange, very strange debate indeed between transatlanticists on the one side and so-called Russland Versteher, which could be translated into those who understand Russia, which means they like Russia, or they like, or they, they have a very positive idea of what Russia is doing, uh, in-depth Russia expert uh, obscures the analysis of, geo of the geopolitical evaluation, uh, evolution of this uh, border conflict on the western border of Russia and threatens to undermine common reactions by western nations. Now I come to my resume in time, I hope. Uh, do the transatlantic bridges need to be overhauled? Of course they do. Does it make sense to remove, to renovate, sorry, to renovate the transatlantic bridges? Of course it does. Is the partial accordance of political interests and values a stable enough basis? There are no guarantees. Common interests and values do not just exist, they must be encouraged, constructed, maintained. And here, a lot more can and should be done. If not, the damaging political consequences will be felt on both sides of the Atlantic. Thanks. Please welcome Luc van Mierlein. Now one encouraging sign of course, we can all say that everything is going bad and, and etc. But I'm trying to pick up a few uh, glimmers of, of of hope of strategic awakening. Is that the Commission, together with High Representative Mogherini, last month they brought out a, a uh, reflection paper on what the new uh, neighborhood policy should look like. And there's three concepts which were almost absent before, which now appear. One. Importantly, it's the word interests. Belonging. This was, believe it or not, on the American side, was used to be a kind of taboo word in the EU language. We were just doing values, we did not have the right to have interests and defend them. Interest was a word which appeared in the EU treaty very lately, for instance. And it hardly was there in the, in the earlier conception of our neighborhood policy. Now it is, it is there sometimes three times in one sentence. Um, so that's progress, I would say. Also, there's much more talk about differentiation and variation and, in all kinds of ways. So clearly, uh, stock has been taken of the, the, uh, that the, the uh, this putting everybody in one basket is, is, is a dead end. Thirdly, interesting also, a greater aware awareness that if we want to 
have good relations with our neighbors, we also have to look at the neighbors of the neighbors. This means <coughs> bringing Russia in. Uh, when you talk about Middle East, with the uh, Middle East players. So here again, there is some, um, let's say, conditions of strategic wake up are, are there. Now, on the third point, whether Europe, um, Europe as a player, as an actor, um, of course, it still remains, I don't have to spell it out here, a highly complicated system with Brussels institutions, actions by member states, but I would say that there are certain signs that things are more integrated than in the past. If I look at the five years I spent at the European Council, so the body where all presidents and prime ministers gather like six times a year, in 2010, for instance, I'm hardly exaggerating, nobody really cared about Ukraine except for countries to, uh, at Ukraine's border. The Dutch Prime Minister, for instance, <coughs> Ukraine was kind of Polish hobby. And this started to change already before the Maidan events, I want to stress. So for instance, I mentioned this Vilnius summit in November 2013. They were all there because they understood that what was happening in Ukraine was important to everybody. Uh, with the southern migration, there is also a slow shift um, that, and maybe we are here at the eve of a change of approach in how we deal with refugees, but I don't want to uh, speak about that now. My, my problem of this afternoon is about that issue. <laughs> there is also, on the institutional side, a more central role of the body of leaders, the European Council, and some of these leaders, including the German Chancellor, of course. Now, people sometimes in Brussels get a bit upset about it, saying why should Merkel and Hollande should be in Minsk uh, brokering a ceasefire deal with Putin and Poroshenko rather than President of the European Council or, or Commission or High Representative. Well, I'm personally not very doctrinal on this at all. I think <coughs> it was very good uh, that the Chancellor and the French President were there. The more so since in their public communication they made it very clear that they were there on behalf of Europe. Uh, when the Minsk ceasefire was, was brokered, they were flying right back from Minsk to Brussels where, as it happened, there was a European Council meeting. They debriefed their, their colleagues so that they sort of embedded this effort in, in, uh, in a collective thing. Also, there is a much stronger awareness than in the past about the need of a strategic unity of all 28 EU member states. Here, of course, the, the sanctions toward Russia are the litmus test. Uh, this was the moment of, well, probably the biggest shock in the European geopolitical order since the end of the Cold War. And all 28 leaders realized that they had to be together on this. Now, we all know about differences between uh, economic interests and, and, and geographic proximity, and you can read about in the press that every day, but still it is quite striking, and I think many observers would not have predicted this, that we're now 13, 14 months after Crimea, and when the first sanctions were installed, that there is still a closed front on this, that these sanctions have been upscaled in the wake of the downing of the MH17 airplane in Ukraine, an event which had also big impact in this uh, country.